Good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Geological Society. My name is Megan O'Donnell, and I'm a Policy and Outreach Officer here at the Society. Today, we have arrived at the final public lecture of 2019. We are also marking the close of the Society's Year of Carbon. Throughout the year, we have explored past variations in the Earth's climate and oceans, as driven by changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide and what these past changes tell us about the Earth's future. We have also looked at the many ways in which the solid Earth and the carbon cycle interact. Despite the advances presented, many aspects of these interactions remain unknown, particularly those relating to carbon reservoirs and deep beneath the Earth's surface. Our speaker today, Simon Mitten, will explore the history of how researchers discovered the dynamic interior and how they are in assessing the role that carbon plays in these processes. Simon Mitten is a Life Fellow at St Edmunds College at the University of Cambridge. He studied physics and astrophysics before moving to the Cambridge University Press, where he served as an executive director from 1982 to 2001. Following his retirement, he returned to research, specialising in the history of astronomy and planetary science in the 19th and 20th centuries. Please join me in welcoming Simon to the stage. So, this is a different kind of public lecture in this room because I am going to be giving a talk which is a history of science talk uh, rather, than a rather than a talk about um, very recent research in the, in the earth sciences. And uh, let, me let me tell you how this has arisen. I've been working for four years uh, with, on the Deep Carbon Observatory project, which closed uh, a few weeks ago in October after 10 years of operation. I'll have a few words to say uh, about the foundation and operation of the Deep Carbon Observatory. Um, and then I have selected about 15 or 16 um, pioneers of deep carbon science beginning in 1600 and going uh, almost up to the present day. Uh, and I'll tell you the human story behind the people who made the discoveries. When I first started working in the history of science, um, I found that the literature could sometimes be rather disappointing uh, in that you were told a tremendous amount of detail about how an experiment was designed, conducted, and so on. Um, and you learned very little uh, about the, pers the person or the people who had, who had done the work. And um, I've specialised in my presentation style in trying to tell some of these uh, human stories. Um, uh, I, will then, uh, uh, I will then briefly explain um, how deep carbon science and the tectonic revolution of the 1960s, um, how, the, how, these two, how these two couple together. So th the foundation of the Deep Carbon Observatory um, began with the observation that um, carbon is the element of life, Carbon fuels supply most of our energy, and carbon-bearing molecules in the atmosphere play a major role in climate change. Carbon as the element of life, uh, the science here is important because, uh, car because carbon um, uh, inter inter interacts with so much other stuff and uh, forms such a great variety of molecules. And during the conduct of the Deep Carbon Observatory, uh, more than a dozen completely new carbon minerals uh, have, been, uh, have been found. But when the, the carbon, Deep Carbon Observatory started off, uh, as, you as you just heard, um, it was to address the problem of the great ignorance uh, that we had um, as recently as 12 or 13 years ago about how much carbon is there inside the Earth? What is it doing? How does it move around? How does it get exchanged between the Earth's interior uh, and the um, atmosphere? Uh, how has the Earth system, Earth system science, and the carbon cycles 
um, how have they changed uh, uh, over time? And the starting point was that our knowledge of the interior is very limited. We can only find out about the interior from measurements and observations which we take, uh, which we take at, the, uh, at the surface, generally speaking. The interior of the Earth, uh, here are the, you can't read the amounts, but um, most of the Earth's carbon is in the core. That's where 90% uh, of the carbon is. Um, and then uh, something like 8% uh, uh, like is in the mantle. It's the carbon in the mantle which is highly important and significant in this inquiry on deep carbon because it's in the mantle that the carbon is being moved around. The mantle is where um, it can be stored for hundreds of millions of years until, until it, it is outgassed in, in uh, volcanoes. And the mantle provides a high-temperature, high-pressure environment. And therefore, you can do a lot of interesting uh, uh, geochemistry um, with the carbon in the mantle and, obs and uh, discovering uh, how, it, um, how it is included in melts, fluids, uh, and so on. So, uh, the, mant the mantle is where, is where um, all, the, uh, all the action is. The, uh, the amount of carbon in the, in the atmosphere is 600 gigatons, um, which, uh, which sounds um, a lot, but it's a very, very tiny uh, fraction of the total amount of, of uh, carbon, um, carbon on Earth. So the Deep Carbon Observatory was a t was a ten year project. Uh, it was um, it was headquartered at the Carnegie Institution of Washington. They had uh, a grant of fifty million uh, U.S. dollars to spend over ten years, and they spent the lot. <laughs> what did they What did they spend it on? Uh, Almost all of it um, went on seed funding. The point being that there were no institutes anywhere or universities that had um, institutes of deep carbon research and this sort of thing. And what deep carbon science was going on involved biologists and physicists and chemists and so on, um, uh, big data scientists, who were spread around numerous institutions. And so at the organizational level, the purpose of the Deep Carbon Observatory was to enable all these researchers to find each other, um, hold, uh, hold, planning, hold planning meetings and come up with research programs. And um, the, the Deep Carbon Observatory um, financed all of that um, organizational and administrative stuff uh, with the individual individual researchers um, contributing contributing their time uh, and also being able to get funding from the research authorities in their own countries, so it was a it was an it was an enabling uh, it was an enabling project. And uh, here's the mission statement that they started with: um, to promote a transformational understanding of the physical chemical, biological roles of carbon in Earth's interior through an international, interdisciplinary, decade-long initiative dedicated to achieving a fundamental understanding of Earth through carbon. Now, um, uh, I was invited to, to join the Deep Carbon Observatory um, as a principal investigator when it was already halfway through uh, the the uh, time of the project, and the reason for that is uh, when the um, when the executive were looking were looking at this uh, statement here, um, one of with the uh, one of them, Bob Hazen, who gave a public lecture in this room earlier this year, um, he said, "We need a history of deep carbon science because when." 
when the Sloan Foundation and other supporters at the end of this campaign say to us, what have you achieved? We actually need to have a fairly thorough and definitive statement about what had been achieved and by whom um, before, before we started. So rather than just, rather than just saying um, uh, we're, largely, we're largely ignorant about deep carbon science, my job was to work through the literature and try and build up a coherent narrative of big research breakthroughs in the past which were nothing at all to do with the role of carbon in the earth at the time the investigations were done, uh, but, the, but the findings made a contribution to um, the deep carbon science as we understand it today. So I'll begin with uh, William Gilbert. William Gilbert is an important pioneer of deep geophysics. He, uh, he became, um, he was one of the most outstanding scientists and philosophers of his time. Uh, he, towards the end of his life, he was working in the court of Elizabeth I. Um, he was one of Elizabeth I's physicians. I have once seen a typo in a book saying he was one of Elizabeth I's physicists. <laughs> so he was, he, was, he was a physician. And beginning about um, 1580, he decided that he wanted to make a fundamental investigation of magnetism. And in particular, to understand how the magnetic compass worked and what was going on. So uh, he conducted many, many experiments uh, for 20 years, and in 1600, his great textbook, De Magnete, on the magnet, was published. And um, uh, in this, he describes his, um, uh, his experiments, he describes the properties of magnetism, uh, and so on. And he uh, puts forward the hypothesis that Earth's interior, somehow or other, uh, has behavior which is characteristic of a bar magnet. North Pole and a South Pole and, uh, and, all, that, and all that sort of thing. Now, from the point of view of the philosophy of science, which is my area of interest, um, uh, what is fantastic about Gilbert is he studies, the, he studies magnetism for 20 years, and at the end of that, he makes a very important suggestion about the physics of the Earth's interior, um, that, there, that there, is a, there is a magnet in there, and furthermore, and more importantly, that by conducting the right sort of experiments at the surface of the Earth, you can learn about Earth's interior. Uh, the quotation that I've got there from him is this. In the discovery of hidden things and in the investigation of hidden causes, stronger reasons are obtained from sure experiments and demonstrated arguments than from probable conjectures and the opinions of philosophical speculators of the common sort. <laughs> and... Um, the, uh, the deep carbon context that I've got for this slide is you can see in the, in the woodcut that a blacksmith is um, hammering a piece of, uh, a piece of iron. Uh, that, uh, that piece of iron, um, think of it as a, a knife blade or something like that, uh, that piece of iron um, is, lying, is lying on the anvil there, exactly north-south, uh, and it, it, gets heated, it gets heated up to somewhat over 600 degrees um, Celsius, at which point the uh, magnetite um, in the iron, uh, the molecules are able to align themselves with the, uh, with the Earth's uh, magnetic field. Um, and so when that, when that is cooled down, um, you've then got the Earth's magnetic field frozen into the, 
frozen into the, frozen into the magnet. And the, this has connections for us, which you'll see towards the end uh, of this lecture, because this, con this concept uh, that when um, uh, iron, or uh, I'll use it in a context, basalt, um, freezes after emerging from the Earth's interior, uh, it will capture an imprint of the direction of the Earth's um, magnetic field. So it was Gilbert who began that. Second person who had quite a lot to do with, um, with uh, magnetism, uh, um, I'm, an, I'm, uh, I'm an astronomer, and uh, in astronomy, of course, Edmund, Edmund Halley is very important for Halley's Comet and showing that the comet was on a periodic orbit. Actually, that was probably the least of his achievements. Um, his, really, uh, his really great achievements were he wanted to improve navigation at sea by understanding better how a magnetic compass behaved as you went on a journey, on a voyage, uh, by ship across the oceans. Uh, he went to St. Paul's School um, in London, and St. Paul's is on the banks uh, of the Thames, and from an early age he was very familiar with great voyages of, great voyages of, of uh, discovery, um, going from outside uh, his school. Um, he, knew that he knew the captains and the mariners of uh, some of the ships uh, quite well. So, the intellectual puzzle which um, Halley wanted to solve was this. Uh, as, I'm sure you, I'm sh as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, a, a magnetic compass seldom points directly at true geographic north. Um, the amount by which it deviates from that is called magnetic variation. And the magnetic variation, why is it the magnetic variation? Because it varies from place to place on the surface uh, of the Earth. Halley undertook two great voyages of scientific investigation between 1698 and 1700. Um, and uh, on these voyages, which went down the, they went down the eastern coastline of North and South America and the western coastline of Africa, uh, he was making continuous measurements of by how many degrees was the compass needle deviating from, uh, from true north. And um, when, he, uh, when, he, when, he, when he did that, uh, he was then able to produce this map, which actually shows you lines of equal magnetic variation. So... Um, his concept was that a navigator having one of these maps and then going across the ocean and making measurements of the variation would be able to work out where, whereabouts, whereabouts they, they, uh, they were. So it was the future development of the British Empire um, that, uh, that, that led to Halley um, uh, to do this. Now... Uh, when he, when he published his, his results in, uh, when he published his results in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, uh, he came up with a nice model of how the bar magnet inside the Earth might work and what it might do. And uh, he said that his model was too speculative because he didn't have enough data. He knew what he didn't know. And uh, he came up with a really imaginative way of um, uh, getting around this, and that was um, uh, towards the end of his paper in Philosophical Transactions, he calls upon all mariners on great voyages to make daily observations of their position and of the magnetic variation. And when they get back to London, they are to send them to the secretary of the Royal Society so that Halley will be able to incorporate them with his data. Well, needless to say, that didn't happen. But um, <laughs> the way in which he fits into my story is uh, one, of the, 
one of the philosophical principles of the Deep Carbon Observatory uh, was that you need to get global data from all parts, uh, all parts of the Earth, and importantly, you need to get uh, the observers to agree to publish their data straight away, uh, not sit on it for years and years and years uh, and try and come up with their, uh, with their own model. So that's our connection there. And um, th this, this story of, of uh, magnetism continues into the 19th century with a wonderful campaign called the Magnetic Crusade. This was set up by um, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, the famous um, world traveler, uh, one of the greatest natural philosophers, scientists um, of his day. And um, he, was a, he was a pioneer who, he had multiple interests. Uh, one of them was uh, climate change. And significantly, uh, he was also a very great um, popularizer, a sort of David Attenborough of his times, as it were. So um, in 1829, uh, he sets up magnetic observatories throughout the Russian Empire. Uh, this, is all, this is all about Imperial Russia uh, wanting to give the lead um, uh, on um, finding, finding out what's going on with the, with the magnetism inside the Earth. By uh, 1841, they had 53 observatories, and they were doing synchronized observations. What I mean by that is... They were all observing at the same time. And do you know why? Because the variable sun, with its solar flares and sunspots and so on, um, causes the strength of the magnetic field to be uh, varying at, this, at the surface of the Earth if you've got sufficiently accurate detectors. Um, uh, Queen Victoria, uh, uh, I, think she must, I think she must have been um, perhaps stimulated by uh, Albert on this, um, but uh, she authorised the construction of magnetic observatories throughout the whole of the British Empire. Uh, and there's a little sketch of one of them there. That's in India. And that one was managed by the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, again, the, the connection with, with uh, the Deep Carbon Observatory and carbon science um, is that this is the earliest example you'll find of international cooperation and geophysical exploration that extended um, over an entire decade. A bit of chemistry now. Um, everyone, of course, has heard of uh, Lavoisier, um, the uh, pio pioneering French chemist. Uh, he, um, he, systematized, uh, he systemized the study of elements and um, the arrangement of elements in tables and so on. Uh, at a time when there was barely any difference between alchemy and uh, chemistry in the, uh, in the laboratory. Um, so he named, he, he named the sixth element carbon uh, and um, conducted this, uh, this, ex this exciting um, experiment here uh, where he uses a giant lens and piece of apparatus in order to set fire to a diamond. That was, a, that, was an inc that was an incredibly important experiment because, because it, showed that, it showed that diamond is made, uh, is made of carbon and he oxidized it by the heat of the sun. His, uh, his work on respiration, in other words, what happens when we breathe in and out, incredibly important. Uh, he, was, um, uh, he, was trying to, he was trying to find out why was it that air changes when it's breathed in and out? And part of the reason for this is he knew that a guinea pig in a bell jar would live for about an hour. And uh, he began to take measurements in, inside stuffy rooms. And he went to, he went to a theatre and uh, measured um, the amount of carbon dioxide in a vertical in a vertical column, um, before an audience came in, and then when the audience had left um, after two or three hours, uh, and he found a significant increase in the amount of carbon dioxide, which back then he referred to it as fixed air. Uh, when he thought about that, he worked out that if the if the 
theatre, uh, if, the, if the room where the, where the audience was, if it had been completely airtight, they would have suffocated after five hours. Um, and then he started doing experiments. He's the, he's, the, he's the first one to use a human guinea pig. Um, here is his, uh, here is his assistant. He's wearing, a, he's wearing a face mask. And um, he's, breathing, he's breathing in and out. They can measure how much CO2 there is. Uh, and they find out that um, when, when, he's, when he's energetic uh, and, and doing things, um, that, he, that he's, uh, he's breathing out more carbon dioxide. And, uh, and um, what, La, what Lavoisier uh, established was that, uh, that ox oxygen, oxygenation and respiration um, uh, are the, op the opposite of each other. 1792, um, he suggests that there must be something that plants are doing that is responsible for keeping the air fresh. Uh, next one is the gentleman who's, who's outside here. So you're all fully familiar with him, uh, William Smith, and uh, he was a coal prospector, as I expect you will, you all know if you've read the if you've read the the famous book. Uh, and um, he uh, he began to study the fossils more carefully, and in 1799 at 29 Great Pulteney Street, Bath, uh, he dictates. Um, he dictates to two associates what the order of the strata is in the in the in the uh, in the coal measures um, uh, in in uh, just out just outside Bath. Um, what 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 Smith did uh, was to discover the geological setting and the history of subsurface carbon. Um, he was the first recipient of the. Wollaston Medal of the Society, although he was never himself a fellow of the Society. Um, no exaggeration to say, back then, uh, the, uh, the people who were fellows of the Society um, regarded, him, regarded him as a bit of a country bumpkin um, uh, who was pulling a fast one to uh, get money from landowners by pretending to survey for um, coal. It wasn't, it, wasn't like, it wasn't like that at all. Um, as Simon Winchester's book uh, ably demonstrates. Another Frenchman, Jean-Jacques Abelman, Abelman uh, he, he was a, he was a, a uh, mineralogist and mining uh, expert. He'd been educated at the École des Mines in, uh, in Paris, which is a government institution. And when he graduated, he was appointed as a government inspector of mines. Uh, he began to do, when he was going around inspecting mines, uh, he began to do um, uh, chemistry. This was because uh, uh, at the Sèvres National Porcelain Manufactory, they had, they had managed to discover that the secret ingredient used by the Chinese was kaolin. And um, Abelman was uh, keen to find out what the parent rock was of uh, kaolin, um, uh, because if he could, if he could find that, uh, it, it should be easy to find kaolin um, deposits. Anyway, in doing that, he came across what we now call the car the silicate carbonate cycle. In other words, silicate rocks are slowly dissolved by carbonic acid, the CO2. Um, dissolved, uh, dissolved in in uh, in air, um, and that uh, this is this is accelerating the um, erosion of rocks. Uh, silicate when the when the dissolved silicate reaches the sea, uh, it can it can interact, um, change with CO two, and it can form uh, it can form carbonate uh, carbonate rocks, um, magnesium. Magnesium and calcium silicate are uh, soluble um, in water, uh, but they, uh, the, the, the calcium, the, the, the magnesium uh, carbonate is not and um, uh, forms, all the, forms all these carbonate deposits. Uh, he, um, uh, he, hit on, he hit on the concept of a deep carbon cycle um, and that the carbon dioxide 
which was removed by weathering rock, um, actually uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, replaced by carbon dioxide um, coming out of uh, volcanoes. Now, because he, because he was a government scientist, he had to publish um, in, uh, the, in, the, in the government-sponsored um, journal, um, Annale des Mines, and this meant that nobody outside Paris uh, was aware of the work that was being done. Um, the, person, uh, the person on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, um, uh, Thomas Sterry Hunt, um, uh, he, uh, he was government geologist in the province of uh, in, in Quebec, as a, result, as a result of which uh, he had access to French journals and he spoke French fluently. And he came across Abelman's papers and realized they were very, very important. Um, he wrote to the Royal Society uh, and uh, nobody took any notice of this. So these papers were not discovered again until 1996. So that's a... A good, a, good a good example of the silent treatment. Now, to have a deep carbon cycle, um, we, need to have, we need to have deep time. And uh, this, is an, this is another sort of important concept that had to be developed uh, in order to um, convince people that we should be looking more at what happens in the Earth's interior. Now, I've chosen James Hutton, Charles Lyell, and um, Adam Sedgwick and Charles Darwin. At the time when these people were active, uh, the age of the Earth um, was the 4004 BC, uh, which occurs, which occurs in, the, uh, in the red lining of the King James um, Bible. Now, I'm not going to go into any of that because it's not, it's not relevant. Uh, it's simply to say that uh, when Hutton, Lyell, and Sedgwick were thinking about how old is the Earth, um, they were up against a great, um, a great establishment um, of people who were still looking for the flood or the deluge. Um, uh, William Smith uh, was one who was looking for the deluge, and so was um, Cuvier in, uh, uh, in Paris. What happens is that um, H uh, Hutton... Um, uh, completely rejects any kind of um, uh, supernatural intervention uh, over, the, over the natural um, forces. And uh, he was very influenced by um, the... He was, he was influenced by the moral philosopher um, uh, Adam Smith and also by David Hume uh, and encouraged to think in terms of a very long time scale in which growth and decay are all in harmony. Uh, this is the famous concept of uniformitarianism. Um, uh, Lyell, um, uh, who was born in the year that Hutton died, um, when he was doing his professional work, uh, he, was, uh, he was absolutely convinced um, that, uh, that Hutton was right and that the timescales must be enormous. And uh, um, his famous little quote is, the present is the key to the past. Adam Sedgwick uh, of, um, of uh, Cambridge, in 1831, in his address as president of the Geological Society, uh, which back then met in Somerset House, uh, he, had been, um, he had been a fierce defender uh, of the short time scale and the flood and catastrophism and all that sort of thing. But he suddenly changed his mind. Um, he stood up at the podium and um, in, his, uh, in his address, um, uh, he, said, he said that catastrophism just didn't work and there must be a very long time scale, of, time scale involved. And uh, he, fa he famously um, came up with this expression, we cannot take one step in geology without drawing upon the fathomless stores of bygone time. Now, young Charles Darwin in Cambridge, um, he had an opportunity to work as what we today would call a summer intern um, and go and do field work with uh, Adam Sedgwick. And uh, uh, Darwin, um, 
became absolutely enraptured by the way in which Sedgwick was saying um, the evolution of the earth, rock and all that sort of thing, um, uh, takes, takes a long, long time. And we have unlimited amounts of it. We can draw as much as we wish from the bank of time. We will never exhaust it. Uh, and uh, that was actually influential when Darwin went on his five-year voyage uh, and um, began to think about the origin of species, because that needs a lot of time. And so the deep carbon context with these four is the, is the emergence of the concept of deep geological time and cycles that may extend over hundreds of millions of years. Now, um, I've got to get into the 20th century, otherwise we'll never <laughs> stop. So uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, I've, I've chosen a couple of things, and this is the first. Uh, by the beginning of the last century, it was very clear to anybody working in Earth sciences that um, Earth's interior had very high temperature, high pressure, and therefore a lot of interesting chemistry um, could take place. Now, that required you to have an apparatus in which you could create high pressure and high temperature in the laboratory. And the first person to um, uh, make a lot of progress with uh, a good apparatus was Percy Bridgman at Harvard University. And um, his breakthrough uh, was to design a seal for apparatus, which would actually seal more and more tightly uh, the, higher the, uh, the higher the pressure. And um, very quickly, uh, he was managing to get up to two gigapascals, which is 20,000 atmospheres. Uh, he, he then decided to apply this um, apparatus not to earth sciences as such, but to materials science. And um, uh, the, the little remark which is made about him is um, he squeezed everything he could get his hands on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> peanut butter. You can make diamond from peanut butter, I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, the important contribution he made to deep carbon science was this. If you think of diamond in the, uh, in, in the lower part of the mantle, we know it has to come up through kimberlites in order to reach the surface. So it has to travel through the mantle. Um, Bridgman found that in the phase diagram of carbon, uh, that unless carbon moved through the mantle quickly, um, it, would, it, it would turn to carbon. So it's, but carbon is unstable um, towards the upper part of the mantle, and therefore it has to make the journey uh, uh, very quickly. So Bridgman got the Nobel Prize for squeezing everything he could get his hands on. Um, uh, at, at about the same time at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, at their geophysical laboratory, um, they had set up the geophysical laboratory expressly for doing extreme pressure and um, temperature. Uh, and uh, Yodo used this apparatus in order to explore the igneous rocks and heat transfer in the upper mantle. In other words, um, the stuff that deep carbon scientists refer to as reservoirs and melts. Deep time lets you have continental drift. Uh, and <clears throat> um, Wegener, a meteorologist and atmospheric physicist, uh, he, he, made, he made four trips to the Greenland ice cap. This was in order to try and understand the meteorology of Greenland uh, because um, uh, transatlantic aircraft uh, were first beginning to attempt um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the transatlantic flight uh, going over Greenland. Um, like other people, he became fascinated by the jigsaw fit of the coasts of uh, South America and West Africa and uh, he did the fit by using the boundaries of the, uh, uh, of the continental plate um, uh, rather, than the, rather than the coastline. And he confirmed the match um, by looking at fossils. Now, <clears throat> in his lifetime, this got nowhere because the, uh, because the physicists were all saying, well, this is, this is impossible anyway. Um, you, can't, you can't move a continental block. You haven't got, you haven't got any... Uh, mechanism of doing so. Um, Wegener always insisted 
that Earth history can only make progress um, if, you have, uh, if you've got all the known facts in front of you. Another one in London, Arthur, Arthur Holmes, uh, um, uh, he, started, he started to work very early on radioactivity in, uh, in rocks, and while he was still an undergraduate, um, he managed to date a rock by, uh, by looking at the products of uranium decaying to, uh, decaying to lead. Uh, and um, in this way, he was, he was soon able to show that some rocks were a billion years um, old, and in the age of the Earth, uh, he gave, um, gave 1.6 billion years for the age of the Earth. Eventually, uh, um, he was able to refine all this uh, to get up to an age of four and a half um, billion. Uh, he, was, he was quite keen on Wegener's model, and in his, text, in his textbook on geology, um, he shows how uh, the mantle could move plastically as a result of the heat being released by the radioactive decay of radium, which Pierre Curie had discovered in uh, in 1903. So we're beginning, we're beginning to get near the uh, modern picture. He was a very careful man. Um, he didn't even put this in his book until page 506, and uh, uh, um, he said it was just a little hypothesis. Uh, we move, um, we see the hypothesis developing more with uh, this person, Harry Hammond Hess, uh, a, a marine geologist at Princeton, um, uh, who, had, who um, was very keen on going to sea in order to, do, uh, in order to do geology. He had a big interest in the ocean floor, uh, which of course was um, largely inaccessible, but uh, during, wo during World War II, he had, uh, he had command, whoops, he had command um, of this troop carrier here, um, taking 1,500 assault troops to Iwo, Iwo Jima, uh, and all of the uh, all of the all of the battleships on on the Pacific uh, had sonar, um, and they were required to make you know frequent readings. Um, Hess became uh, just absolutely fascinated. He he ran his echo sounder the whole time, and he reduced his data on board. Uh, and in this way, um, he managed to find a new kind of structure. Uh, these are called geos, um, flat-topped, extinct volcanoes, which had been, been eroded, which were eroded to a flat top uh, when they were actually above, above, the, above the surface, um, and later the volcanoes got carried down underneath. Uh, um, uh, Hess um, builds on what... Um, builds on what Arthur Holmes had done. Uh, uh, he acknowledges um, Arthur Holmes and uh, uh, starts promoting a model in which you get a mantle plume um, coming up through the mantle and the oceanic crust, crust sliding down in, in uh, trenches um, to go down uh, beneath, the, uh, beneath the continent. His connection, then, is that ocean, new ocean floor is created at ridges and is subducted into the upper mantle. He was not the, he was not the only person to have this idea, um, but uh, um, uh, his life is, qu is quite impressive because he stuck with the problem for a long time and managed to crack it. Uh, the, here's the first woman in our story, um, Mary Tharp. Uh, um, she was at the uh, Lamont um, Geological Observatory, and um, her, her supervisor um, made observations with this research vessel here. These are, these are observations um, of depth, depth sounding. Marie's job was to reduce the data in order to produce cross sections of the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, quite, um, quite sort of uh, tricky work to do. However, she noticed, oh, I mustn't step away from the podium. You see there, there's a notch, and then we go, then we go further, further south, and we've got another one just there. We go further south again, and we've got one there. 
So as she said, um, on the mid on the mid Atlantic Ridge, um, you've actually got a central valley. It shows up it shows up best on this um, on this one. I found these a few months ago in the Library of Congress in Washington, and um, that, that's why that's why the slide's a bit scruffy. I haven't cleaned it up. Anyway, she said t she said to um, Bruce Eason, uh, look, I think we found a central valley. And uh, famously, he dismissed this as, as girl talk and uh, <laughs> wouldn't take it seriously. Um, but it soon, beca it soon became uh, apparent uh, that she was correct. Um, and by the 1960s, they produced these sort of beautiful um, maps showing the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the transformed faults, and where the basalt is, uh, where the basalt is um, pouring out. So the, the, um, what, ha what happens next uh, is it becomes, a, it becomes a Cambridge story. Hydrographic, hydrographic surveys uh, were being done with magnetometers. And the magnetometers were measuring the strength of the magnetic field on the ocean floor and the direction uh, of the magnetic field. And they produced zebra stripe zebra stripe diagrams um, uh, like this um, uh, with the magnetic field going in alternative um, directions caused by the uh, occasional switching of the magnetic polarity of the Earth. So they're, they're recording the magnetic field um, at, uh, at the time that the, uh, that the lava or basalt um, solidified. Anyway, what, what Fred Vine did is um, he, he showed uh, from, from measuring the pattern uh, with data he got from the Indian Ocean uh, that at the, uh, at the mid-ocean mid ridges, the uh, basalt lava was coming out and uh, forming, a, forming a symmetric pattern um, as it spread out on either side. And he was he was able he was able to date this, so um, that was a, that was a great big breakthrough, uh, which um, confirmed what we now know as um, plate tectonics. So I want to just quick I just want to quickly um, summarise uh, what <coughs> what we know now about carbon deep in the earth as a result of the breakthroughs made by the dozen or so pioneers I've talked to you about. Um, but in my, in my uh, book, which is currently in press, I have, to, I have a total of about 130 um, uh, pioneers. Uh, and so this is, the pre this is the present sort of cross-section model of um, whole earth uh, cycling and what we think what we think is happening. So if you look on, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see the orange arrow pointing up. And that's a mid-ocean ridge. And then in, uh, then in a sort of gray or steel blue, um, you, can see the, uh, you, can see the, you can see the slab, the ocean floor, um, which, is, uh, which is spreading out. That, get, that gets weathered. Um, uh, because, it, because it's got salt water lying on top of it. Uh, you also get um, uh, ocean islands, um, ocean volcanoes. Uh, that's, the, that's, the second, that's the second one across. The orange arrow um, to show that these are places where we, we've, got, we've got CO2 uh, coming out. Then if we, if we go a little bit more to the right, um, you've got terrestrial silicate weathering, uh, which is the blue arrows going down. This is, in, this is introducing um, the carbonates um, uh, into the ocean, um, and uh, those carbonates are taken up by animals in the ocean, and we get chalk and we get limestone and all that sort of thing. Uh, as, the, as the slab descends below the continent, we're looking at the middle of the diagram now, as it goes down and gets hotter, uh, we've got decarbonation taking place of the carbonate rocks. 
uh, that, um, that are in the slab. And um, this, this, this kind of work stems from the high temperature, high pressure work which was being, which was being done uh, on um, you know, what, happens, what happens when you heat rock to high temperatures. Then uh, on the continents, um, uh, if, you've got, if you've got a magma, if you've got the magma, a magma hot spot, some on here, um, that, can that can lead to continental rifts, uh, like, the, like the, um, the, African, the African Rift Valley. Uh, and um, there too, you've got, uh, you've, got carbon, you've got carbon dioxide coming out, and you've got carbon being, tran being transferred in. What Deep Carbon Observatory was all about was trying to specify how much carbon is inside the Earth, particularly in the mantle, what are its reservoirs, how does it move around, and how is it being exchanged from the inside to the outside or the outside to the inside, and what are the timescales associated with all of that. This is a complicated model with a lot of moving parts and a lot of time steps. Um, but um, th but that, that basically is what deep carbon science is all about, showing how the whole Earth carbon cycle relates to plate tectonics and the, um, and the dynamics, and the dynamics um, of the Earth. Just briefly, the future of deep carbon science, uh, the decade financed by the Sloan Foundation, uh, finished six weeks ago. And uh, what is going to happen is that the various research groups that were created by getting geologists and chemists, et cetera, et cetera, out of their silos uh, and doing, doing some field work, uh, many of those programs will continue, um, but, they, but they, will be, they will be funded by national um, uh, sources of funding, National Science Foundation, um, European Union, Science Research Councils, and so on. But uh, deep carbon science has, has a big history, and an, an important decision which we made at the closing meeting was that uh, going forward, um, people working on deep carbon science have got to be much more upfront um, about uh, the, da the dangers of carbon, uh, carbon in the atmosphere and climate change. Now, because Deep Carbon Observatory, when it was set up, was funded by the Sloan Foundation, um, Sloan was anxious that they would not get all tied up um, in, Amer in, American, in American politics, but now there's a new confidence. Anyway, um, that's, my, that's my little story about the, uh, about the history of... Um, uh, deep carbon science, uh, the great people who got us to where we are now, and the hope for the future that this kind of science will develop and that it will inform societal issues, uh, which the deep carbon scientists haven't done so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon, for an absolutely brilliant talk. We've got about 10 minutes for some questions. Um, if you have any questions, please just raise your hand and wait for a microphone to come over so we can pick up the audio. That would be great. Yes, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I was um, noticed that the, the emphasis you placed on the dynamics, the chemical dynamics of the, of the mantle. Yes. Uh, but you rather threw me early on by saying nine-tenths of the carbon is in, in the core. Yes. Now, how do you arrive at that estimation, and, and what influence does the core have on the uh, carbon in the mantle? Right. There's, <coughs> there's, there's, there's no connection. The carbon in the core is trapped. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's, not able, it's, not able to, it's not able to move... Um, uh, anywhere. Uh, the, uh, the, te the techniques for finding out how much there is there is basically using, using seismology um, and, seeing, and seeing how the seismic waves are refracted and you know, from that, from that you, can get, you can get a density and from that you can get, um, 
you can get you, you know how much there is there uh, <clears throat> there's another way of doing it it's always it's always encouraging in science when you've got two or three ways of finding something out and they're completely independent of each other so what this also comes out of is um, theories on the formation of planets and the early history of the earth and um, uh, that's all to do with the with the solar nebula and where you know where where were the different elements and how much would have been um, captured so so we've got we've got two handles but it's not it's not robust so you're right to ask the question <laughs> Thank you. This isn't actually a question, but it was a, a wonderful observation I had the chance of. I went on a cruise, mm -hmm. and in the cabin, one of the um, television channels was streamed from the bridge. Yes. So we got the depth readings along with a number of other things, and I observed the mid-ocean ridge sometime yeah. in the middle of the night, but it was worth waiting up for. Good for you. <laughs> and I also observed, as we came through the Bay of Biscay, that in the space of half an hour, we went from 180 feet to 4,000. Right. <laughs> That's good. Just, That's good. Just, just a point. Um, if, you go, if, you, if you do transatlantic Southampton to New York, which I've done five times, uh, you go over the mid-Atlantic ridge in the middle of the day, and, and they always announce it. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering in the previous slide um, what the mechanism for uptake of carbon at the Rift Valley is. Is that just weath weathering? If yeah, just, just weathering. Okay, yeah. so, it, so it corresponds to the arrows in the sea yes. then ultimately. Yeah. Okay. Oh, maybe a further question. Um, how do you consider the, the impact of um, stable, ca a stable carbon isotope um, analysis? Has that been very significant to... Right, that's, a, um, that's been a huge field for the Deep Carbon Observatory. Um, as, you're, as you're aware, it's quite technical. And um, uh, because this is a history lecture, uh, that, that was too, too recent for me to include any of it. But uh, the, the, work on, the work on isotopologues um, uh, is, is, making, is making great progress, and ever such a lot is being learned. That, 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 that's a watch this space topic. You, you can, you know, Google it. <laughs> um, it's not really to do with history, but it's to do with geology. Yes. I just wanted to ask you if people had sort of um, come up with theories as to why um, carbonates or why carbon is concentrated within the mantle. And I refer particularly to Oldonia Lengai, which is a carbonatite volcano in northern yes. Tanzania. And within that region, there are a number of extinct yeah. carbonatite volcanoes. Yes. And obviously, Oldonia Lengai is the only known yeah. um, active one. How, do, how on earth do you imagine that you can in concentrate sodium and potassium carbonate into those sort of volumes? It just seems beyond imagination. <laughs> Uh, I can't. I can't answer that um, that question because I haven't. I, ha I haven't. I haven't done the uh, geochemistry. I am familiar with what you're saying. That that, that there there is a surprise. There is a surprising amount. And I think it's got. I think it's got there through subduction. Um, mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah. It's that, that, yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. Conundrum yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and on a conundrum, I think is a perfect place to end with a little food for thought. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank Simon again very much for coming and giving a, our lecture today. Um, um,
We hope that you enjoyed the final lecture, public lecture of this year. Um, it cost the Geological Society, which is a registered charity, around £10,000 per year to put on these kind of events. Um, they engage a broad range of audience with key themes in earth science. If you'd like to make a donation to support the cost of us running these events, please do so in the collection box on your way out of the building. Thank you so much for coming to our public lectures, and please join me in thanking Simon one last time. Thank you.